two, one. Welcome! <laughs> yeah, everybody's like, I don't know what time it is. Well, it's time to worship. And uh, obviously, we don't have a screen tonight, so unfortunately, we don't have words. So you just want to, if you really want to know what they are, they'll be on the back wall back there. Uh, but uh, good news, our screen will be installed Thursday and Friday on this platform. And so this coming Sunday, our screen will be active. And then next week, we will be working on kids and youth. So, yeah, give God praise for that. Come on. Yeah. Can we just lift our hands? I, I, listen, I'm just thankful that God, it's in his timing. You know, so let's just give, let's just give thanks. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. Lord, we give you honor, glory for who you are. And Lord, we love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen.
Bible, you are good. You are good, you are good. When there's nothing good in me, you are love, you are love. On display for all to see, you are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin.
ever reaching, never failing. Nothing compares to the embrace of your heavenly Father. It says, bring the best robe and the ring and prepare the calf because my son who was dead is now alive. My child who was lost has been found. God, I thank you for the embrace Heavenly Father, Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Who is well? 
you having fun, Joey? I am. Yeah. Yeah, I wish you'd show it a little bit. You know, you, you I wish you would, you and Destiny would show that, you know, you was excited to lead worship, and I, I heard you were getting married. I, I heard, heard you getting married, and, and I asked her fiance, I, I said, hey, I said, here, you're getting married. He said, I don't know anything about that. And, and I said, buddy, you're in a doghouse already. I, we need to have a one-on-one -on -one session of what to say, when to say it, and when not to say it. And, and um, they moved our tape, Jay. Oh, thank you, Jay. This, uh, by the way, come here, Jay. Uh, we have such a small guy. This is, this is uh, Destiny's fiance. And um, uh, one, one day when I grow up, I, I hope to be big like him. Praise the Lord. Always good to stay on the good side of him. Praise the Lord. You okay, Nan? Praise the Lord. Just give me a second here, okay? Everybody just take a big, deep breath in and let it out. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's Wednesday. This is your first time here thinking, oh, what kind of guy is this? I'm the senior pastor here, believe it or not. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, and uh, it's Wednesday. And just one more time, take a great big deep breath. Eat slowly. Take it in slowly. Let it out slowly. <laughs> oh, I should. You know, where's Sonny at? He'd say, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, now, now most of you know, Tam and I have had three, well, uh, she had three kids. I was there to help raise them. You know, you, you love that when a guy says, yeah, we had, dude, you didn't have anything. Okay. So, so anyway, each of the three times that, uh, I got my wife pregnant, um, well, I mean, they're all mine. And um, we had to go to Lamaze class. They even, is that still even a thing anymore? You know what, Terry, you know what Lamaze class is? So is it still a thing? They still have Lamaze class? So Lamaze class is, is where they, they teach the, uh, the, 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 the lady how to breathe when she's having contractions and this and that. And they, they uh, expect the husband to be the coach and coach him through. You know all this, and of when to inhale and exhale, and shh, shh, you know, and all this, and so on. So, so you know, three times, and you know, she never listened to me any of the three times when we got in the in in that real intense. I remember one time. Now, my wife, she is the sweetest woman you will ever meet. She she, she can't. The other night we were following a car home and they ran over a possum and it, you should have been in the car. And I mean, she was just like, I'm thinking, you want me to go back and have a, a funeral for it or what? You know, so she's just sweet. She, she's just that way. And um, so we're in, the, in this, uh, I don't remember, if, uh, it was one, it was Kirk. It was the first one. And I'm trying to coach her how to, how to breathe, you know, through this. And I said, no, come on, honey, you got to breathe. And she sat up. She grabbed hold of my watch and ripped it off my arm. She said, don't you yell at me. I said, pass out, baby. Just go ahead and pass out. <laughs> and uh, where's all you men at? Yeah, you the same thing happened. So, but, but I still went the other two times, you know, just I knew it wasn't going to help. So, so it's just, just, just take, just one more time. Take a deep breath in, okay? Slow. Let out all the cares and the fears and all the stuff of today and this week and know that God holds it all. He holds the whole world in his hands. He holds the whole world in his hands. And, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I, I just sense it. I, I need to say that. God will protect you. 
You know, God protects his kids. Uh, we were in prayer, pre-service prayer, down in room six, and Terry was talking about Psalm 91 and, and hiding under the shadow or, or the wings of the Almighty. And, and instantly my, my mind went back to when I was a child. I, I, uh, I didn't grow up around here. I grew up in Doddridge County uh, on a 76-acre farm, half mile up a dirt road, and, uh, and, and I, I enjoyed it. We had a big barn, and I was somewhat inquisitive as a kid. I, I, I was over at the barn one, one day looking for something. I, it's hard to tell what it was, but I remember going in the barn and we had chickens and horses and cows we had all that stuff and and I go in the barn and I slide the barn door back and it's a concrete barn and I walk in and I peer around the side and there was a hen with biddies over there or chicks you don't know what biddies are chicks over there and just a little little hen and I wasn't fat as a kid I was I was husky Okay, I was fat. I, I was, I was just, I was, and and um, and all at once, when that hen realized I was there, the pin feathers on her neck come out, and her wings came out, and she came after me, and and I, I had, I had her, I had her by size, weight, everything, and as soon as she turned and fluffed out like that, I turned and took off. And I'm out the door crossing the wooden bridge, bridge that had gaps. I said, had gaps. My toe caught a gap, and down on the, on the bridge I went. And the only thing I can think is this hen is going to flog me from behind. She stopped at the door, but I was already. If a hen will protect her biddies that much, how much, God, how much more will God protect you? You need to get a hold of this. God is for you, not against you. And you just need to understand it, accept it, and find peace in it. Amen. Hug your neighbor, high-five him, however, whatever you need to do. There was something else I was going to say, but I forget. Not you. Not you. Yeah. Yep. So we, we um, at Maranatha, um, there's a, there's a, Maranatha is kind of a melting pot of a, a place. It's really, Maranatha is a hospital. This is a place where people usually come to, to get healed up because of wounds and trauma and so on. And I'm not talking about physical stuff. But uh, there's a lot of different backgrounds that come to Maranatha. And my wife is going to preach this evening. And um, you may come from a church that have a background where they don't believe in women preachers. Uh, it's okay that, that you believe however you want. No one will believe that more than what my wife used to believe that. Um, but this is what I know. God uses women the same as he does men. And uh, I was raised in churches where females could cook the food. They could watch the kids, change the diapers on the kids, and teach the kids. But they couldn't teach adults because they were females. And I don't believe that way. Uh, I, I believe that God uh, speaks through men and women. And in this house, we celebrate and honor both. I believe there's not only prophets, but also prophetesses. They're in the Bible. And I believe that if a prophetess can speak a woman or can speak a word to someone and give them direction, then I believe that they can preach the word as well. Uh, so I want you, if you would, please, uh, to stand to your feet. Make welcome to the platform of Maranatha, my beautiful bride, Tammy. Well, praise the Lord. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's the only one worthy of praise, honor, and glory. He alone is worthy. Let's lift up a shout of praise to him right now. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. We praise you today, Lord. You're worthy, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. And if you are one of those people who, like me, were raised in church to believe that women, women should not preach, 
I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to continue to pray and ask God to put that in the Bible so that I don't have to get up here and do this, because it's not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> but I tried to search it out, search it out, search it out. I prayed, and I, I was out to prove people wrong. I was out to prove people wrong, okay, that, that, uh, that I was right and they were wrong, because we Christians like to do that, right? We like to prove that we're right and they're wrong. Um, but that is not what happened. God uh, kind of turned the tables on me, humbled me a lot, and taught me some stuff. You have to be teachable. If you are set in your ways and you are not willing to learn new things and open your mind to someone else's point of view or uh, possibly that maybe you were taught wrong or you believed wrong or whatever, uh, the Bible is the truth. The Bible is the Word of God. That's where we find the truth. We don't find the truth in what we were taught as a child. We don't find the truth in what someone else has told us. We don't find the truth in uncle whoever's opinion. We find the truth in the Word of God. That's the only place that we find the truth. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about faith. <clears throat> Lord, stir up our faith tonight. Mm. I was... Um, scrolling through the internet the other day, might have even been yesterday, I don't know, and uh, I, I was looking at these reels. Do you watch reels? Uh, yeah, they're, yeah, you can't, you can't avoid them. They're everywhere. So I saw this uh, little reel, and I get a lot of Christian reels because I love Jesus, and I guess the internet knows that. So it'll send me these Christian reels, and I had this reel um, that came up that said Christian pickup lines. And I thought, this ought to be really good. So I, I clicked on it. The first one, and this guy, he, he I mean, looks so dorky. And he's sitting there, and he says, well, your name must be faith because you're the evidence of things hoped for. <laughs> so there's one for you single guys. Go ahead and, go ahead and take that. Um, <laughs> it's probably not going to work for you, but, you know, feel free to use it if you want to. Uh, but actually, that is what I want to talk to you about tonight. It just so happens. What is faith? What is faith? Well, the Bible says faith is, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what is faith? Faith is substance and faith is evidence. Those are two concrete things. They're not concepts. They're not ideas. They're not thoughts. They are actual tangible things. Faith is tangible. Faith is not an idea or a concept. Faith is tangible and it is the currency of heaven. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, we have trouble believing in things we cannot see until our experience tells us otherwise. So for instance, um, airplane travel. I'm sure that when the Wright brothers first came up with that concept, no one believed it. I'm sure they didn't. We believe it because we've had experience in airplane travel, we know that it's possible. We know that it's not only possible, but most of us have probably done it. But back at that time, no one had seen it. So they didn't believe that it could happen. If someone, a uh, pastor was talking Sunday about lung issues, and oh my goodness, after that, so many people have come forward and said, I've been having this issue, and I've had that issue, and you know, all of these different things. So that was, that was a rhema word Sunday morning. If you were not here, you need to go back and watch that service. It was amazing. But <clears throat> if you have issues in your lungs, someone can look at you and say, well, I don't believe you. You look fine. I don't see anything wrong with you. But you know because you experience the breathing. You experience the issues with your breath. And no one can argue your experience with you. Okay? But we have trouble believing in things that we can't see until we have experience. I can't see the wind, but I've had many experiences with the wind that tell me that it's real. It would be difficult for me to trust God even based on what I read in the Bible, even based on stories of how he's moved in the lives of other people, those things might encourage me, but until I have an experience with him myself, I'm going to have trouble believing him. In order to trust him, we must know him. And in order to know him, we must be willing to step out from what we know and pursue him. 
We're not going to know him until we pursue him, and we can't pursue him unless we let go of what we think we know and all the stuff that we don't know and pursue him, and then he begins to reveal himself to us. And the more he reveals himself to us, the more faith we can have in him. That's how it works. In the book of Mark, we find a father who was willing to scrape up what little faith he had and take a chance on Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You know, we might look at that and say, that's pitiful. What do you mean scrape up what little faith he had and take a chance on Jesus? Didn't we all do that at some point of time or other? When we first came to Jesus, we weren't full of faith. We took a chance. We scraped up that little bit of mustard seed of faith that we could find, and we took a chance on Jesus. And what did he do? He proved himself to you. And because of your experience with him, you have faith. The more experiences you have with him, the more your faith grows. So let's talk about a father today who took a chance on Jesus. There are three things I want to point out from this text. Number one, our faith is in God, not in people. Number two, our faith is in God, not circumstances. And number three, our faith is in God, not the outcome. Turn to Mark 9, 14 through 24. I'm going to read from the NIV. And it begins like this. When they came to the other disciples, this is Peter, James, John, and Jesus. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Church people arguing? What? That's, that's so weird. <laughs> as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought to you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Let's pause right there for just a moment. Number one, our faith is in God, not people. This desperate man brought his son to the disciples to ask them to help him. They could not. People cannot help you. We turn to people so many times and we need help, we need advice, we need money, we need whatever, whatever it is that we need. We turn to people because we believe that they are our source. People are not your source. We cannot put our trust in people. People will let you down. They will disappoint you. God will make sure of it so that we don't place people above him. We have trouble trusting God completely because of our natural inclination to trust him like we trust people in compartments. Let me explain. For every person I've ever met, I have compartments of trust and distrust, okay? And here's what I mean. I might trust someone to mow my lawn and do a really good job, but that doesn't mean I'm going to trust them to watch my grandchildren, right? I might trust someone to do my taxes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I would trust them to teach a class here at church. Understand? We trust people in compartments. I may trust someone to give me advice on the stock market, but not to give me advice on my marriage, right? So I trust this man right here, my husband, completely. I trust him more than any other human on this planet, but there are things that I'm not going to trust him to do. I'm not going to trust him to pick out my clothes, right? There are certain things, <laughs> no, seriously, there are certain things that you trust people with, and there are certain things that you don't trust them with. And it doesn't matter how much you trust that person, there are still things that you don't trust them to do or trust them with. We trust God that way. We think that God's the same way. We trust him in compartments. I can trust God to forgive me of my sins, but I don't trust him when I'm sick. I can't trust him for healing. I trust him with someone else's situation with their child, but the situation with my child's different. I can trust him to help me get a job, but I don't trust him with the resentment that I'm harboring against someone. We trust him with some things, but not with others. God is not like people. He can be trusted completely with everything, no matter what he is, he can be completely trusted. And that's what faith is. Really, that's all it is. Trusting God in all things, for all things, and through all things. Just trusting him. 
That's what faith is. People will fail you. They will let you down. They will break your trust. Like I said, God will make sure of that. Nowhere in the Bible are we instructed to trust people. You see, we get love and trust mixed up. They're two different things. We are commanded to love. We are not commanded to trust. In fact, here's what the psalmist said. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. And that's just the truth. We are not commanded to trust. Love and trust are not the same thing. You can love without trusting. In fact, you'd better. You'd better do it. We're commanded to love everyone. Love everyone. Everyone, everyone? Everyone, everyone. Yes. We are commanded to love everyone. We must remember that everyone has issues and value. Everyone. Everyone, everyone. <laughs> what about people who are annoying? Yes. We have to love those people who annoy us. Yes. What about people who don't believe the way I do? Yes, everyone. They are in everyone. What about people who are kooky? They are in everyone. I love kooky people. Kooky people don't bother me in the least. Kooky people wear their crazy on the outside. It's the people who hide their crazy on the inside that you got to watch out for, <laughs> right? <laughs> See, there's a difference between kooky and evil. With kooky people, you know what you're getting. And the best thing that I love about kooky people, you can't offend them. I love that about kooky people. I think they're great. Evil people, different story. You can never please an evil person. No matter what or how much you do for them, they're never satisfied. They will embellish the story so that they look like a victim and people will side with them. They make situations worse on purpose because they crave attention. They like an audience. They like for people to agree with them. It feeds their ego. They're experienced in the art of manipulation. They divide and destroy healthy relationships by turning people against one another. Know anybody like that? They're toxic. That, that word toxic is overused. If somebody disagrees with us, we call them toxic. That person's not toxic. But there are toxic, evil people in this world. There are toxic, evil people in the church. And we must avoid them. We must stay away from them because... Some people are just so relationally unhealthy that it's impossible to have a healthy relationship with them. That's just the truth. Some people you have to love from a distance. Yes, you still have to love evil people. Yes, but you love them from a distance. It's kind of a hands-off kind of love. Yes, I love them. Yes, I pray for them, but I can't get caught up in their mess. Normal people will hurt you. Here's the difference. Normal people will hurt you. They will disappoint you. They will let you down but they don't do it on purpose. They don't mean to. And when they realize that they've done it, they're sorry for it. A toxic, evil person is never sorry. <laughs> it's always your fault. If you only build relationship with relationships with people who will never hurt you or let you down, you're going to be an awfully lonely person. You have to go into every relationship knowing this person's going to let me down. This person's going to disappoint me. You know what? I'm going to love them anyway. But evil people don't see anything wrong with their actions. They believe that they are perfectly justified when they hurt someone. They will not be corrected. They see confrontation as an attack. Healthy confrontation builds healthy relationships, and it's an act of love. It's not an attack. Confrontation is healthy. Confrontation in love is healthy, and it's an act of love. We live in a non-confrontational society. We are more easily offended than ever before, but less willing to resolve issues than ever before. Reconciliation involves healthy confrontation, and healthy people appreciate it. When you confront someone who is emotionally healthy about maybe something they've said or something that they've done that hurts you, they appreciate it. A healthy person appreciates that. Reconciliation involves healthy confrontation. Imagine someone walking around church, let's say, with their dress tucked into their underwear. Now imagine, right? Of course you don't want to tell them. It's embarrassing. Nobody wants to tell them. But you know what's even more embarrassing? To walk around like that. And it is the kind thing to do to go and tap them on the shoulder and say, excuse me, I don't know if you know this or not. <laughs> I hope you don't. But... It's an embarrassing situation, but if we look at that in the spiritual, there are people walking around every day all around us with their spiritual dresses stuck in their spiritual underwear, and nobody wants to confront it. 
Nobody wants to say anything. Everybody acting like it ain't going on. And nobody wants to confront it. Nobody wants to say anything. Nobody wants to embarrass that person. But you know what? It's an act of love to tell them. So we just walk around saying, has anybody talked to them? Think anybody said anything about that? No, nobody has said anything to them and nobody wants to confront it. If you are, everybody sees it, but nobody wants to say anything. If you are offended and you're going around talking about it to everyone except the person who offended you, you don't want reconciliation, you want pity. An emotionally healthy person, I don't even know why I'm off on this right now, but an emotionally healthy person will go to the person who offended them and work it out between the two of them. An emotionally unhealthy person goes to everyone else but that person because they want to receive pity and attention. All right, let's get back to the word. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. I like how Jesus doesn't ever pull any punches. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. I love Jesus. He's the coolest. Our faith is in God, not our circumstances. It's easy to get discouraged when you don't see things change. It's easy to get discouraged when you pray for years and things seem to go from worse to even worse and never better. Can you imagine this father? His son was like this from childhood, he said. Can you imagine the torment that this father faced every day watching his son suffer, watching his child suffer? If you've ever had a child that had something on them trying to destroy them or make them destroy themselves, then you understand. If you've never been there, you don't understand the torment that this father had to go through every day watching his son suffer. And I'm sure he did everything he knew to do. I'm sure he did everything that he could think of and even more to help his son, but nothing helped. I like it when Jesus says, if you can, what do you mean if? is what he was saying. What do you mean, if? Notice Jesus didn't say, well, you don't have a ton of faith, so I'm not not healing your son. He didn't say that. He confronted the issue. What do you mean, if? He confronted his lack of faith, but it didn't keep him from moving on his behalf because this father had some faith. This father brought his faith to Jesus. Great faith is wonderful to have, but all God requires is a mustard seed of faith, a mustard seed size size seed of faith is all God requires to move. It doesn't have to be great faith. You see, God doesn't live by our rules. God doesn't go by the things that we go by. It's um, God is just when life isn't fair. God is good when life isn't. God can always be trusted. It's hard to trust God when things around you look bleak. But I've got good news for you because we walk by faith, not by sight. It's not about what we see. It's not about the bleakness. It's not about the darkness that's all around it. It is not about our circumstances. It is about the fact that we serve a God who can always, always be trusted no matter what. The opposite of faith is not doubt. How many of you would say if someone asked you, what's the opposite of faith? Oh, the opposite of faith is doubt. No, it isn't. The opposite of faith is certainty. If you are certain about something, you don't need faith. But if you believe, if you believe, that is the substance of things hoped for. That is the evidence of things not seen. God is working all things out for our good. Do you really believe that? I want you to think about the thing right now that's going on in your life that is just keeping you up at night, that's just driving you crazy right now. We all have them from time to time. Think about that thing, and I want you to think, do I truly believe that God is working even that out for my good? Do I believe that? Do I believe that God can be trusted in my circumstances? 
whatever that is. Everything is possible for the one who believes. We're back to the word now. Everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I love this. This is my favorite line in this whole, this whole chapter. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I love that. Do you see the conflict within him? I do believe, but I also don't believe. He's, he's conflicted. We're all like that. We're all like that. We have a measure of faith and we have a measure of disbelief and they're constantly in conflict with each other. But our faith must overcome that unbelief. Our faith must be stronger than the unbelief. We're always going to have those things. We're always going to face things that are uncertain. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. So number three, the last point that I want to make tonight, our faith is in God, not in the outcome. You know, there's a dangerous teaching that many of us have uh, listened to, maybe believed, and that is if that you have enough faith, nothing bad will ever happen in your life. Bad things happen because you don't have enough faith. Have you ever heard that? Well, that's happening because your faith is weak. You don't have enough faith. Bad things happen to everybody. <laughs> I hate to be the one to break it to you. If you look at the most, well, I'll get to that in a minute. If you look at the most faith-filled people in the word of God, awful things happened to them. It wasn't because they lacked faith. They had faith through those things. It wasn't about the outcome of their situation. It was about their God who they serve. It was about their God. That's who their faith was in, not their outcome, not what was happening. It was God. The teaching is that if you have enough faith, nothing bad will ever happen in your life. Then when the outcome isn't what we prayed for, we lose faith in God. Our faith wasn't in God in the first place. It was in the outcome. We put our faith in the outcome, not in our God. So when the outcome is different than what we were believing for and praying for, we blame God. And God was never at fault there. Our faith was never in God put your faith in the outcome. It doesn't matter what the outcome is. Even if, even if, even if God does something different than I think he's going to, I will still trust him. Even if God does something different than I want him to, I will still trust him. Even, the, even if God does something that, that I, I wasn't expecting or didn't want or whatever, that goes against what I believe or what I want or what I've prayed for, my faith is not in that thing. My faith is in God, that he is going to carry me through no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, no matter what the outcome is, he's still God. The outcome doesn't change the fact that he is still God. He's God whether the outcome is what I wanted or whether it isn't. He's still God. My trust, my faith is in him, not in the outcome. You see, even Jesus prayed for one thing and got another. Even Jesus. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. That's what Jesus wanted. Did it happen? No. It happened differently than what he prayed. But here's the key. This is what he prayed. Your will, not mine. Because we don't know what God's doing in the midst of our circumstances. We don't know what God's doing. It may be for our good. It may be that God is working it out for our good, even though things look bad, even though all I see is darkness around me. You see, God works in the darkness. I don't believe that God creates the darkness. The darkness is created from a lack of light. We live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. Therefore, we have darkness all around us. We have problems. We have issues. We have sicknesses because we live in a fallen world. We have sin because we live in a fallen world. There's, there's darkness all around us. But God, even though he didn't cause the darkness, he will work in the darkness. And he is working it out for your good, your good if you are called according to his purpose. If you are one of his called, if you are his child, his chosen, he is working it out for your good. It doesn't say he might be or he's thinking about working out for your good or he could but he's not going to. He is. He is. You can take it to the bank. He is working it out for your good, even 
in the darkness. Having great faith doesn't ensure that you won't have trouble. In fact, sometimes it invites it. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 36 through 39. I want to end with this. <clears throat> this is what it says, and you know Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. All of the great people of faith in the word. And then it says, and I don't even have time to mention this one, that one, and the other one. And then this is what it ends with. These nameless, faceless people that this chapter ends with. We don't know about them, but this is what it says. Some face jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. And we think we have trouble. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith yet none of them received what had been promised. They still believed. Even though the outcome wasn't what they wanted, I'm sure, it did not shake their faith because their faith was not in the outcome. Their faith was in their God. If our faith is in our God, we cannot be shaken by our circumstances. We cannot be shaken by the darkness around us. We cannot be shaken by what men and women do to us or say about us. Those things can't shake us if our faith is in God. Our faith cannot be in people. It cannot be in our circumstances, and it cannot be in the outcome. Our faith must be in God. My faith is not in what I see, but it's in Him. God will have no gods before Him. If our faith is in a person, a circumstance, or an outcome, instead of God, that thing is an idol. Anything that we place our faith and trust in besides God is an idol. We've placed that above God. I want y'all to stand tonight. We're going to close with, a, with an altar call. And I just want you to search your heart tonight and think about that for a moment. I want, you, I want to challenge your faith tonight. And I don't feel um, qualified to speak on this topic at all, but I can tell you that I am a person who has had great faith. I am a person who has had a mustard seed of faith. And I am a person who at one point thought her faith was dead. I've been to all of those places and through all of those places, the thing that I have learned is that God can be trusted. When you put your faith in anything besides him, you are gonna be let down. You're in for a rude awakening because he alone can be trusted. He alone is the one who is worthy to put your faith in. It doesn't matter what your circumstances tell you. It doesn't matter if you've prayed for years about something and you're just not seeing it. God can still be trusted. He's still working and he's still moving even in that darkness, even in that dark place, even in that hardened heart that you think is unreachable, God is still working. God is still working in your family. God is still working in your finances. Even when you can't see it, even when you don't know it, even when you don't believe it, he's still working. He's working it out for your good. As long as you are his child, as long as you are his called. So tonight I wanna to tell you that if you have that thing that you just need to give to God and trust him with it, I want you to bring it to the altar tonight. Whatever that thing I was talking about a little bit ago that, that's been keeping you up at night, that thing that's been stressing you out, that thing that you've been asking God to move in and it doesn't look like he's ever gonna do it. I want you to bring that to him tonight because he can be trusted. He can be trusted with those situations and those issues that we can't do anything about. Do you remember that father? I'm sure he had done everything. He had, he had exhausted everything trying to help his son and didn't think he would ever get any better, but he brought his son and his mustard seed of faith to Jesus. And that's the key. Scrape up what little bit of faith you can come up with right now and bring that faith and your situation to Jesus. 
because he can be trusted and you can know and take to the bank that he is working it out for your good. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. God, we thank you for a mustard seed of faith. Lord, we thank you that when all is dark around us and the outcome isn't what we expected, isn't what we prayed for, you are still working and you are still God. Our faith is in you. Our faith isn't in people. Our faith isn't in our circumstances. And our faith certainly isn't in the outcome. But our faith is in you. God, help us to trust you in all and through all. We love you, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. My faith still holds on to the Christ of Calvary. Oh, blessed rock of ages, pray for still holds on to the Christ of Calvary. My faith still holds on to the Christ of Calvary. Oh, bless Blessed rock of ages, cleft for me. I'll gladly place my trust in things I cannot see. My faith still. of Calvary I'll gladly place my trust in things I cannot see my faith still holds on to the cross We know the Bible tells us that without faith it's impossible to please God because those that come to him must believe that he is God and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Faith comes by hearing and I pray that we've heard the word tonight that this scripture, this truth that came forward will increase your faith as you dwell on it, as you let it pound into uh, resistance, that, that, that stubbornness that sometimes is in our heart. Let's pray. Father, we want to grow in this faith life. Lord, we want to have more faith, to believe for things, to, to help others, Lord, and pray for things and really believe it. Lord, help us to trust you more. Bring to our remembrance the times when you've been faithful to us, the times where you've taken care of things. Lord, show us maybe we don't even realize some of the times that you've done things for us and how you've answered prayers and how you've saved it. Don't let us forget all these wonderful praise reports and things that have happened to our, us and to others. Lord, increase our faith, we pray, that you would increase our faith and help us to believe for the things that are impossible. Even though it seems impossible with man, and it is, nothing's impossible with you. Lord, we want to believe that deep down in the core of who we are. So, Father, we ask you to help us with any area of unbelief and that we would embrace your truth that's in your word. And that we would trust you even though we don't see it or feel it or sense it. Lord, we would walk by faith. Help us to trust you more. Help us to trust you more. To see your kingdom come and your will be done. In earth, in this earth, in our lives, just like it is in heaven. It's possible. 
with man's impossible, but Lord, with you, nothing's impossible. We believe it. Father, we believe it, and we receive the truth that you have for us. Help us to walk it out in faith, believing in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to see all of you. Hope to see you back here on Sunday. Be careful going home. You are dismissed.